This is the Energy Education Podcast for December 2nd, 2012. I'm Kevin Hurley. This podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education. Fairwinds is a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating policymakers, the public, and the next generation. Today marks the 70th anniversary of the first self sustained man made nuclear reaction. This first atomic pile was built in Chicago in the basement of a football stadium. The nuclear milestone gave birth to decades of secrecy and what would come to be known as the nuclear priesthood. On this 70th birthday, we'll also discuss nuclear subsidies, thermal discharge into rivers, and the ability of decay heat to cause a meltdown. Finally today, we'll look at what to do with all of that nuclear waste. Joining us in the studio today is Fairwind's chief nuclear engineer, Arnie Gunderson. All coming up next. Could the United States experience a meltdown like Fukushima Daiichi? Will the mainstream media tell you the whole story about the nuclear industry? When you want answers to what's going on around the world in nuclear news, Fairwinds provides them. And your donations provide the needed funds for us to keep giving you factual information from people with industry experience. Please hit the donate button. So, Arnie, welcome home, and thanks for coming on. Hey, Kevin, thanks for having me again. Yeah, I'd like to start by talking about the Fairwinds webpage. We just released a new version, an updated version of the same webpage. And the new, on the new version, we're set up now to take listener uh, questions. Uh, we'd like to invite listeners of the podcast to email us with recorded audio files of questions that will be selected, and you'll be able to answer them on future podcasts. So listeners who are interested in submitting questions can send their questions to podcast at fairwinds.org. Um, but uh, let's get into what we need to talk about today. And that's the 70th anniversary of the first man-made nuclear chain reaction. This happened in Chicago. I understand this happened under a football stadium. Can you tell me about that? Uh, yeah. First of all, I, I really should compliment you and the great job you and Maggie did on getting the site up and uh, up and running with the new format. It's really cool. I hope the, the listeners to this go over and click through it because it's very user-friendly. Um, yeah, I, um, I've been invited to speak out in Chicago uh, to a conference. Uh, it's called 70 Years of, uh, of Nuclear Waste, and it, it's, uh, uh, it was chosen for, because on December 2nd, 1942, the first uh, man-made self um, uh, self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction occurred in a racquetball court under a, a stadium in uh, at the University of Chicago. And um, people had thought that maybe you could get a chain reaction going for a couple years, but they recall Albert Einstein wrote to um, Roosevelt and uh, got the Manhattan Project going. And of course, uh, less than a year before uh, the Pearl Harbor and uh, the United States had en- entered the war, the, the fear in America, of course, was that the, most of this technology was German. And uh, they were afraid that the Germans would come up with a nuclear weapon before us. So the um, uh, 70 years ago today, December 2nd, was the first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. And this was above ground. Oh, yeah. It was, it was in a racquetball court underneath a, uh, a football stadium. What did this look like? It was a series of uranium blocks and uh, carbon. Carbon is a, a good moderator of neutrons. So they have uranium carbon, uranium carbon. Then they pulled uh, some of the, the control rods out that were designed to absorb neutrons. And very slowly doing something called a 1 over M experiment, they gradually added power and added power until the clicking from the Geiger counters became constant. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it didn't go down. It didn't go up, and it just stayed at a constant high click rate, and that told them that they had achieved a chain reaction that was self-perpetuating, and they weren't sure that they could do that. Uh, that was a major breakthrough. A guy named Enrico Fermi, and a guy named Leo um, Slazard were the, the the two both Europeans who left Europe uh, as a result of the war were the guiding forces behind the American weapons program. And they could stand right next to this thing and watch it? I mean, what, how, oh, yeah. how did this work? <laughs> no, they were standing right next to it. Uh, and, um, you know, people were 
going around taking readings and pulling the rods out and things like that with while they were looking at the nuclear pile. Now, they, you know, no one was really sure. The nuclear pile is the reactor. Yes, it's this, this lump of... Uh, out in uh, the open. Yes, this lump of uranium and uh, charcoal out in the open on the squash court. No one was really sure if you could shut it down, and of course, uh, um, or start it up for that matter. So there was a lot of excitement when it got to be self-sustaining, and I imagine they were excited too when they realized they could shut it down. Uh, that was a, that would be an important thing to do. So seventy years ago, what's come out of this? You know, I'm speaking in Chicago on uh, on December 1st. And the, the speech is five things that, that I don't think have changed in the last 70 years. And the first one dates to the Chicago pile and the fact that it started in secrecy and it started with the, with the military. This, is, um, this industry has been perpetuated over time by the um, – by the need for secrecy in the 40s and then the assumption of the need for secrecy in the 50s and, and, and thereafter. The, um, the, the term is the atomic priesthood, and it was, it was coined in the 50s or 60s, and uh, I've used it, but it's certainly not my, my term. The, the people that control nuclear power don't want the rest of us to know what's going on, and it dates back to the Manhattan Project. There's a bunch of books that uh, talk about the formation of the Atomic Energy Commission, which was the the founding group uh, back in the 40s and 50s, and how uh, they deliberately didn't tell the public the truth uh, initially about weapons testing. A great book for anybody who wants to read it is The, uh, uh, the Day We Bombed Utah, and it talks about how the Atomic Com- Energy Commission tried to cover up um, exposures to people in Utah, particularly in a town called St. George, from bomb testing. You know, they, this fallout was was um, falling all through Utah. People were getting overexposed. And the Atomic Energy Commission went out of its way to downplay the significance of that. So this nuclear priesthood started in the need for secrecy in a weapons program and has continued even to this day. What were the What are the requirements of being part of the nuclear priesthood? Well, um, I was, uh, I, I was uh, paid to go to college by the Atomic Energy Commission. I was one of 20 Atomic Energy Commission fellows. Um, and, uh, you know, they were basically trying to groom priests, you know, the, to, to get the nuclear degrees so that people would, um, uh, would pursue nuclear careers. You know, it, it, there's, a, there's a group in the weapons industry, Department of Energy, and then over in the nuclear industry, and they feel they have the right to, uh, to control the technology without any input from, uh, from the rest of the American public. The, um, the Congress recognized this problem. You know, the, the, the AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, was doing both bombs and nuclear reactors and paying for me to go to college and... Um, <clears throat> so they were promoting and they were trying to regulate, and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. So in 76, Congress split them up and created the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy. And the theory was that the Nuclear Energy Commission would really regulate. Uh, the only thing Congress didn't do was change the people. So the mindset, the, the priesthood mindset that you, know, you and I are, are, are um, not deserving of the, of the information – was born the very first day the uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was created. You know, I even see it today. We're, we're trying to work on um, the San Onofre Project out in California. And what happens is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission goes to uh, Southern California Edison, and they pass documents across the table. And when they after they've read them, they pass those documents back to Southern California Edison. They never, quote, take These are lawyers. No, these are engineers sitting okay. across the table from each other. Yeah, mm-hmm. the lawyers have agreed on this process. So they sit in a room and they pass information to the NRC. The NRC reads it and passes it back across the table. And because the NRC never takes possession of the material, it never makes it into the public document room. So they're so, not required as long as they don't photocopy these documents. They're not required to make it publicly available. Freedom of Information Act, nothing. None of that applies. None of it applies. And, and so the, the priesthood retains its control 
Because outside uh, contractors and outside experts, and believe it or not, there are some outside experts that would like this information available, are, um, are precluded by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission from, uh, from getting our hands on accurate data that might dispute what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission determines. The Chicago pile was 70 years ago today. Why still the need for so much secrecy? I think at this point it's, uh, it's ingrained in the culture. And um, th- that really gets to the second point uh, that I'm going to be speaking about, and that's the, uh, uh, the enormous subsidies. Uh, we would not have nuclear power, at least in the form we have it now, were it, uh, were it not for the subsidies from the bomb program. I mean, we invested – the Manhattan Project was $2 billion 70 years ago. And it was a lot of money today, and it was a lot more 70 years ago. So all of that infrastructure that we had made for bombs, we then rolled over and said, well, let's make some commercial nuclear reactors. The, if you look at all of these subsidies for 70 years worth of subsidies, they, um, uh, they would add about – they would essentially double the cost of nuclear power. The, the power cost at, at – the, as it leaves the power plant, the cost of power from a nuclear plant is around $0.05. Cents. And Union of Concerned Scientists has said it would be $0.10 cents had it not been for all these subsidies for 70 years. You know, when you, when you got a kid and then they're in college and you, uh, and you subsidize them and they're 20, that's okay. And when they have tough times in 30 and mom and dad need to subsidize them a little more, you don't want to, but that's okay. But nuclear power is 70 years old and we're still subsidizing it. You know, at some point you got to kick it out and say either make it on your own or don't make it. And we haven't done that with nuclear power. So the idea is then without these subsidies, nuclear power, if left just to the markets, would have failed. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, Peter Bradford, from uh, he's from Vermont, but he was a former NRC commissioner, has said that uh, trying to solve global warming uh, by relying on nuclear power plants is like trying to solve glo- global hunger by feeding everyone caviar. And he really hits it on the head that this is um, uh, an, an incredibly expensive technology perpetuated by an industry that can't seem to get off the dole. So, Arnie, who subsidized nuclear power in the beginning and who's subsidizing nuclear power today? You know, initially it was um, the Department of, of, of War, we called it at the time, the Department of Defense. And... Um, uh, over time, it became the uh, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, and then for the last twenty or thirty years, it's become the Department of Energy. the The biggest proponent of nuclear power in the in the federal government right now is uh, is huge subsidies coming through the Department of Energy. They just announced another half a billion dollar subsidy for uh, small modular reactors, little reactors now. Um, ten years ago, they were pushing huge reactors like the ones we're building in, in um, Vogel, at the Vogel plant in Georgia. You know, they said, well, we need these big plants because they're safe. And now they've decided we need small plants because they're safe, but we're still building the big ones with, a, with taxpayer guarantees. You know, it's, it starts with Congress, though. If, if um, the industry has, has its claws into Congress, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, the industry has its claws into Congress. And Unless we get our congressmen to um, uh, to change and to uh, to say, wouldn't this money be better spent balancing the budget? If we did that, uh, I think that uh, we can begin to change this uh, this industry. But right now, it's uh, it's really got its hooks into Congress. So nuclear power takes a lot of money to run. It also takes a lot of water uh, out of the environment, and you've talked a bit about that. Can you go into that just a bit? Yeah, the, um, this dates back to the bomb program as well. The first uh, nuclear reactors were, uh, were, were put out in the, uh, in the Washington desert on something called the Hanford Reservation right next to the Columbia River, and, and they needed the Columbia River to cool the plants. Uh, the, it was a huge river, and they, uh, the, the production of energy from nuclear power needs an enormous cooling source. There's something called the Carnot efficiency. It's a complicated thing we don't need to get into, but nuclear plants have the lowest Carnot efficiency of any way to produce electricity. Um, coal plants are much better, and, and um, gas plants are better still. Uh, 
Carnot so, efficiency basically being how efficiently it uses water to cool, or what, what does that mean? Yeah, it, basically it means that for um, a kilowatt of power out, a nuclear plant uses about 40% more water to cool it than a coal plant. I see. And about half, uh, and a gas plant uses half the water to cool it as a nuclear plant because of this thing called Carnot efficiency. So we talk about this being a modern technology. First off, it's 70 years old, but on top of that, that we've really regressed back to the 1800s as far as the thermal efficiency of these plants. So what that means is they use an enormous amount of water. The Indian Point plants use 2 billion gallons a day to cool. And uh, uh, you know, across the country, that's, that's not... That's not abnormal. It's pretty much that's the, being drawn on the Hudson River. Yeah, two billion, and of course that kills the fish and uh, the fish eggs and things like that. Throws so, hot water back into the river. Yes. Yeah. So it's that hot yeah. water that's going back into the river that could have had another use, like like for fish and feeding human mm-hmm. beings. And we're essentially killing that water as we run it through the uh, uh, the nuclear power plants to cool them. Dave Lockbaum at Union of Concerned Scientists has said that. We, we've always been, been taught to believe that nuclear plants will solve global warming. But it's actually just the opposite. We need to solve global warming so we can have nuclear power plants. And the reason for that is river flows are dropping. And we're finding these power plants around the country and around the world have to shut down at times of peak demand because the river flows are dropping. So these power plants that, are, um, that use so much water in fact, rely on a cool climate. And uh, um, now that we've got global warming, uh, we'll wind up shutting our nuclear plants down because the rivers either, the flow in the river drops or the temperature of the river increases. We saw that here in Vermont. Um, Just this summer, the uh, Vermont Yankee had to reduce power um, by about 20%. And the the reason was uh, we didn't get a lot of rain in New England. And the river got too hot and the flow was too low. That happened across the country and across Europe over the last couple of years too. For the last 70 years, we've known that nuclear plants consume more water than any other way of making power. And that water, once it passes through the nuclear plant, is less usable, not usable? What is the difference other than temperature? Not to say that temperature isn't important, but between the water going into the plant and the water coming out of the plant. Well, there's two pieces. One is it, it, it kills whatever organisms are in the water. Right. Uh, it's heated up something about 30 or 40 degrees hotter than when it came in. So any fish eggs are, are mm-hmm. just totally fried. Um, and the other part is that once it leaves, um, the large fraction evaporates um, so that it, uh, it then uh, increases the amount of moisture in the atmosphere and um, is another factor in global storms like Sandy. You know, there's more moisture in the atmosphere now because the temperature's warmer. And we're throwing up more moisture into the atmosphere, in part because of uh, nuclear plants heating up the water faster than so other it's ways. literally killing the biology in the water as it passes through. It's Yes, that's absolutely right. And some universal truths that have come out of that that are still apparent today. Um, one of those, and this is something that you've talked about at length, is a nuclear reaction, uh, when it's shut down, the heat does not completely go away. True then and true now? Yeah, you know, what enthralled uh, Einstein and Fermi and Slazard and all those guys was that when a uranium atom splits, it creates an enormous amount of heat, more than a million times more heat at an atomic level per atom than, than at a chemical reaction like burning coal mm-hmm. or something like that. So an atom of uranium releases more than a million times more heat than burning an atom of coal. So that's what everybody found is really exciting because you don't wind up using a lot of material. And no one ever worried about the other piece of the puzzle, which is those pieces left behind, the fission products, the split pieces of uranium remain hot too. That was always, well, we can solve that problem. The, the beauty of it was the 95% of the heat you got initially. But the, the, the devil of it was that after you shut down, you still got 5% of the heat to get rid of. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will say all the time, the plants are safely shut down. And what that means is the control rods went in. And that happens all the time. It very rarely does a control rod get stuck. And uh, 
So, but that's only part of the puzzle. As we learned at Fukushima, the Fukushima Daiichi units shut down. That wasn't a problem. The earthquake shut them down. And when you say 5% of the heat remains, um, it doesn't sound like much, but can you put that in perspective? How much is 5% of the heat in a nuclear reactor like Fukushima? Yeah, well, let's look at one Fukushima reactor. Let's say Fukushima Daiichi Unit 2. That had about 3 million horsepower of, of heat in, a, in the nuclear core. And the nuclear core is only 12 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet. <laughs> so you put, imagine putting 3 million horses into something smaller than your bedroom. That, that, that's a lot of heat. So when the reactor shuts down, 95% of that goes away. But there's still 150,000 horses in your bedroom. And they're all running full speed. So they're churning up a lot of heat. And that can't be shut off. That can, that's a fact of nature. It can't be shut off. And, of course, we know from you know, Daiichi, we know from uh, Chernobyl, and we know from uh, uh, Three Mile Island, what happens when you don't cool the core, it melts down. And so a meltdown is inevitable if you can't cool it after you've shut it down. So this comment by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that uh, the plant is safely shut down is, is – uh, it's a half-truth. You know, they, they then have to say, and then, oh, by the way, we really need to keep it cool for a couple of years afterward to make sure we don't get a meltdown anyway. But, of course, they, that, that's not in the lexicon of nuclear power. And, of course, keeping it cool relies on a source of water, right. a reliable source of water. And that gets us into the discussions we've had on this, on, on this uh, Fairwinds podcast in the past about loss of the ultimate heat sink. And I don't think our readers need to hear me talk about that anymore. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Um, so we're talking about not being able to get rid of the heat, but not being able to get rid of the waste left over from the reaction is also a concern. And it's, you know, a topic that's had uh, quite a history. Yeah, this, uh, the conference title is, uh, you know, the 70th anniversary of, of the first chain reaction and 70 years, a mountain of nuclear waste. The uh, General Accounting Office estimates that the Nuclear reactors presently in use will create 140,000 tons of high-level radioactive waste in their, in their lifetimes. And uh, we haven't done anything with any of it. We talked about the Hanford projects out in, um, uh, out in Washington State, and the ground is highly contaminated out in Washington. Just in the last two months, some tanks have begun to rot. That's happened a lot at Hanford. They had single-walled tanks underground because they're so radioactive. The single-walled tanks started to rot. So what they do is— These are storage tanks? Yes, like for, the, for the nuclear or? waste from the bomb program. Now. Okay, bomb waste, right? Bomb waste sitting in, in single-walled tanks underground. So Hanford's solution was to make double-walled tanks. Well, now two of the double-walled tanks have also failed, so they're letting radioactive material into the groundwater again. Now, that's just one example of bomb program waste, but the nuclear power plants around the country right now are storing their waste in, in fuel pools, which I don't believe are safe, and it should be in dry cast storage. But, uh, on site. They're storing on site. On site. Because we have no place to put it. And in some cases, uh, essentially on the roof. That's right. Yeah, there's 23 plants that essentially keep the nuclear fuel on the roof. So you'll hear proponents of nuclear power say, well, if, uh, if only we had Yucca Mountain and that darn Obama, he, he killed Yucca Mountain. But in fact, Yucca Mountain was never chosen scientifically. Yucca Mountain was chosen politically, and the science was forced on the politics. So, you know, proponents of nuclear power will say that the, 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 uh, just, just the opposite, that it was a great scientific thing, and now Obama's playing politics. But that's not the case. When uh, Yucca Mountain was chosen, it was called the Screw Nevada Act. That's within Congress. They a bunch of legislators chose Yucca Mountain. Just quickly, Arnie, what what is Yucca Mountain? It's a um, it's a large mountain in Nevada, and it's um, a couple thousand feet high. And it was chosen. People thought it was earthquake resistant, and people thought it was dry. And it turns out it's quite seismically active, and it's and it's wet. So those are the two things you really don't want in a nuclear waste repository. So the idea was for all of the U.S. nuclear waste, nuclear power plant waste, to go to this mountain and be buried inside? 
Well, Congress's idea was that half the waste would go west and half of it would go east. So there was supposed to be a place to store nuclear power somewhere in the east. Well, we have a lot more electoral votes here in the east than they do in Nevada. So that's where the term the Screw Nevada Act became. So the eastern states say, well, we don't want it, and uh, let's send it to Nevada. Back in the 80s and 90s, uh, the Nevada uh, congressional delegation was quite weak. Uh, now the Nevada congressional de delegation is run by a guy named Harry Reid, who <laughs> runs the Senate. So it's a little bit different that you know, they have political clout now. But there's a lot of technical problems with Yucca Mountain. One of them is moisture, and no one knows how to handle the moisture problem. So the NRC has said, well, 100 years from now, we'll figure it out. We'll come up with these titanium umbrellas that we'll put around the nuclear fuel. And as we're pulling out from Yucca Mountain 100 years from now, we'll install these titanium umbrellas that we don't know how to build yet. And we don't know how to design yet, but we'll be smarter 100 years from now. And we'll be able to, to prevent the moisture from getting on this nuclear fuel. So mm -hmm. we've really delayed important scientific studies, believing that we'll be smarter 100 years from now after we put all this nuclear fuel. <laughs> on top of that, we're also finding that Yucca Mountain uh, has, has a lot of moisture and is seismically uh, quite active. And uh, the moisture will attack the radioactive uh, fuel that right now would be planned to be put in glass. And uh, in fact, the glass doesn't hold the, uh, the, the radioactive fuel forever either. There's a lot of studies that show that within a couple hundred years, that radiation is out into the mountain. Then within a thousand years, it's off the reservation and into um, you know, people's water. Um, that uh, that will you know rely on it in the future. So this issue of what do we do with the nuclear waste? You know, when I was in college, we thought it was the, the answer was right around the corner. Well, Forty years ago, we thought the answer was right around the corner, and we're nowhere near closer to it now than we were when I was in college. Storing it forever. What does that mean? How long is forever? How long does this nuclear waste need to sit in the mountain? Yeah, the, the, the big isotope is plutonium, and there's a lot of plutonium, tons and tons of plutonium in this nuclear fuel. And it's got a half-life of 25,000 years, and the rule of thumb is 10 half-lives. So it needs to stay in, it, in the location you put it for a quarter of a million years. Now, that presents two problems. That, that means that um, we are dealing with before, before humans left Africa— um, before we had written language, before we were really probably even considered, you know, homo sapiens, if we had stored nuclear waste, we'd still be storing it to keep it out of harm's way. Long, long time ago on a geologic uh, scale. The pyramid's 5,000 years old. Oh, yeah. It's 50, year, 50 times longer than the life of the pyramids. Yeah. So we've got to store it out of harm's way for 50,000 years. And it goes two ways. You know, first off, we know language changes. And, and say 5,000 years from now, people forget it's there. You know, do we want to put signs on the surface saying, don't dig here? That's a possibility. And how do you warn somebody 5,000 years from now uh, not to dig there uh, because the worst poisons they've ever encountered are right below the surface? So the question becomes one of linguistics. How do you warn people? But then the flip of that is maybe you shouldn't warn people. Because if you get a bad guy who wants this plutonium so he can blow up his neighbor, he might want to dig there. And if he knows where to dig, then, of course, it's, you know, it, it's, it's open season. So uh, the storage of nuclear waste, keeping it away from humans and keeping humans away from it are, are both conflicting issues. And uh, uh, it just serves to compound the problem. Of course, just blasting it off the planet, just sending it up isn't, <laughs> isn't an option. Uh. You know, first off, it, it would cost an enormous amount to send 140,000 tons of waste to the sun. But the theory is that if it was strong, if, what if the missile misfired and mm -hmm. came down and crashed? It would have to be crash resistant. Well, if it's crash resistant, we may as well just stick it in the earth to begin with. You know? So that was the, the theory about why don't we send it to the sun. Um, first off, cost, and secondly, it's got to be crash resistant anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I get questioned all the time by, by people, and they, they always say, you know, we, we can store nuclear waste for a 
for a quarter of a million years, and, and that's why we should have nuclear power. And um, you know, trust us, we'll we'll figure out a way to store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years. And I always say, well, you're telling me we solar seems to me to be a viable alternative to nuclear waste. And they'll say, yeah, but you can't store electricity overnight. Well, if we can figure out a way to store your store high-level radioactive waste for a quarter of a million years, it seems to me that we'd have the same technology or better technologies so that Americans can figure out a way to store electricity overnight. Overnight seems to me to be a lot simpler problem than a quarter of a million years. It seems like something that human ingenuity could accomplish. Yeah, if we wanted to, I'm sure we could. So that just about does it for today's edition of the Energy Education Podcast. It's December 2nd, 2012. Just a quick reminder to listeners to check out the new webpage, www.fairwinds.org. And Arnie, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks.